Welcome. Uh, I'm Alan Posinke. I'm a general internist in Rockville, Maryland, outside of Washington, D.C. I've been asked to speak about uh, management of fatigue, but since it's hard to manage fatigue without figuring out what's causing it, I've amended the title to Evaluation and Management of Fatigue. A uh, difficult subject to cover in 25 minutes, but I will do my best. I won't have time to read every word on every slide, so there's some additional detail, uh, and I believe you'll be able to refer back to the slides later. I will discuss some off-label uses of some medications. I have no financial conflicts of interest to disclose. So evaluation of fatigue is uh, pretty straightforward. History, physical, laboratory examination. Um, in Ehlers-Danlos patients, more specific testing, uh, for example, of sleep and nutrition and autonomic dysfunction can be helpful because they are common contributors to fatigue. And of course, a thorough evaluation is critical because treatment is gonna be based on the results of that evaluation. So of course, many factors contribute to fatigue in Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Uh, which is why it's hard to do this in 25 minutes. But the big three I refer to are pain, poor sleep, and depression. Autonomic nervous system dysfunction also is a factor uh, both directly in fatigue and in contributing to pain and poor sleep. Uh, many metabolic factors contribute. I'll mention a few common ones. Inadequate rest is unfortunately a common, a common contributor to fatigue uh, as people who are chronically ill and don't feel well push themselves to keep up with the demands of modern life when they probably should be resting. Cognitive tasks, I remind people, use just as much energy as physical tasks, so they also can contribute to fatigue. Emotional stresses are draining, and of course, everyday life tasks um, contribute to fatigue. I often reassure people, for example, that uh, somebody with loose joints going for a walk is probably using twice as much energy when they walk as the person they're walking with who has stable joints. Uh, simply the strain of trying to hold joints in place to accomplish physical tasks uses more energy and contributes to fatigue. This is just a graphic to make the point that depression, pain, and poor sleep all sort of aggravate each other as well as contributing to fatigue. So that uh, to break this cycle, you need to address all of these factors simultaneously. As long as you're in pain, your sleep and your depression won't get better. As long as you're depressed, your pain, your sleep, your fatigue won't get better. Um, and unfortunately, there is no magic formula. Everyone is different. Um, this woman is watching television. There's an advertisement that says, ask your doctor if taking a pill to solve all your problems is right for you. Wish that were the case, but unfortunately, medications can only do so much. How does pain cause fatigue? I think most people who live with chronic pain realize that pain just saps your energy. Uh, pain also limits your activity. So if you're less active, you lose muscle tone. And then when you do try to do something, you tire that much more quickly. Uh, pain disrupts your sleep. Pain causes depression. There are a variety of other mechanisms. One that I think hasn't gotten sufficient attention is cortisol. Cortisol is your body's stress hormone. Uh, pain, among other stresses, is a potent stimulus for cortisol release. And when I review the common signs and symptoms of cortisol with my patients, they look at this list and recognize almost all of them. So I see a lot of people who are frustrated with weight gain around their middle, despite eating, eating very little. Uh, and that's often a, an effect of cortisol. Uh, thinning skin, easy bruising, slow healing are things that ehlers tenless patients have anyway. Uh, weakness, I've highlighted fatigue, irritability, trouble concentrating can all be factors um, related to excess cortisol and hence cortisol from stress contributes to fatigue. So pain is a major is a major contributor to fatigue. People with chronic pain tend to underestimate it uh, or say things like, it's not that bad, I'm used to it, I've learned to live with it, I don't wanna take pain medication, uh, but these are really not helpful because as I mentioned earlier, as long as you're in pain, your fatigue and your sleep and your depression won't get better. Um, uh, I, I refer to something I call background pain, the idea that if you're in chronic pain, eventually you, you um, stop being consciously aware of it. So you may tend to, tend to underestimate how much pain you're in. And then your body tends to make adrenaline in response to pain, make adrenaline in response to fatigue to try to keep going. Uh, and that adrenaline in turn can mask fatigue and make you unaware, a mask of pain and make you unaware of it. Uh, different types of pain require different types of treatment. Uh, I won't go through all the details of this slide except to make the point that Ehlers-Danlos in general is not an inflammatory condition. 
there's some degree of inflammation from the strain of muscles trying to stabilize lax joints. Um, but generally, uh, if you have a hot, swollen, inflamed joint, uh, you need to look for another explanation. Now, there's this is not primarily an inflammatory condition. So uh, there are non-pharmacologic treatments for pain, um, and then there are medications for pain. Again, I won't go through this list. I put this list up mainly to make the point uh, how short it is, um, that we have a relatively short list of medications available to help people manage pain. Um, and if acetaminophen and anti-inflammatories haven't helped you, and you've had bad reactions to the antidepressants and the and the neuropathic drugs make you too sleepy, and your pain is too widespread for topicals to help you much, then you might in fact need opioids for pain control, uh, despite the uh, um, opinions to the contrary from many experts. Uh, like pain, people often underestimate how bad their depression is. They say, well, it's not that bad. I'm, I'm used to it. I've learned to live with it. I don't need counseling. I don't want to take antidepressants. And then, of course, I'm depressed. Wouldn't you be? Um, and these are all things I regularly hear from patients. But again, if you don't address your depression adequately, your pain and your sleep and your fatigue won't improve. So I often point out to people or remind people that you don't have to be sad to be depressed. Your, your primary symptoms of depression could be fatigue and trouble concentrating and lack of motivation. Um, and along the same lines that neurotransmitter deficiency can be significant, even in the absence of clinical depression, you might look at symptoms of major depression and say, well, I don't really have that. Um, but you can still have um, uh, uh, underlying issues with uh, neurotransmitter deficiency. And then again, uh, don't rely on medications entirely. Uh, relaxation stress management techniques can be helpful. Spending time with hobbies, uh, pets, family members, um, this slide just makes that point in a, in a funny way. Uh, you may get more relief from a hug from a family member or a pet or even your favorite stuffed animal uh, than you do from taking pills. So in terms of medication, um, I found that different types of depression, different symptoms of depression respond better to different types of medication. Um, and though it's oversimplifying a little bit, I, I tend to divide these symptoms into those related to serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. And this is a graphic that a lot of my patients have found helpful. If your primary symptoms of fatigue are uh, pain and trouble concentrating and fatigue, then a serotonin type antidepressant is probably not going to be your best choice. Here's a lady who's going to the doctor saying, I think my dosage needs adjusting. I'm not nearly as happy as the people in the ads. So uh, this is important, I think, at both extremes. On the one hand, uh, you don't want to rely on medications entirely to be as happy as the people in the ads. On the other hand, if you're being treated for depression and you're still depressed, then your dosage or your medication may in fact need to be adjusted. So sleep is the, is the third major contributor to fatigue. And similarly, different types of sleep problems require different treatments. Uh, some people have trouble getting to sleep. Some people get to sleep okay, but then are restless and wake up a lot trouble staying asleep. Um, and perhaps most often of all, uh, people don't have trouble falling asleep, don't wake up a lot during the night, but just wake up feeling unrefreshed. So again, people tend to underestimate how bad their sleep is, say, well, gee, I, I've never slept well. I'm used to not sleeping well. Uh, I don't want to take sleeping pills. Um, but again, that's not helpful. You need to address the quality of your sleep to improve your fatigue. So maybe even more than pain and depression, people tend to tend to misperceive uh, what's going on while they're asleep because they're asleep. Um, ironically enough, uh, very often I hear from patients things like, I'm a great sleep. I can sleep anytime, anywhere. Uh, I can sleep 10 hours and wake up and go back to sleep for two more hours. And if I point out to them that that probably means that they're not a good sleeper, uh, that's hard for them to understand. We know that many patients with sleep apnea and live movements aren't aware of them because they're asleep. Um, and the most common um, finding in, in sleep studies of patients with Ehlers-Danlos are frequent arousals or disruptions to the continuity of sleep and or a lack of deep sleep. Uh, and these problems often don't cause any symptoms except just feeling tired and unrefreshed on waking. So, Sleep studies can be helpful, but I always make the point that only if they're carefully interpreted, if the person who's reading the sleep study doesn't know what they're looking for, 
uh, sleep studies are often misread. Fortunately, the latest generation of home sleep monitors can be very helpful um, in at least estimating how much time you spent in deep sleep, uh, how often you've wakened during the course of the night. Um, and if you don't have access to one of those, a uh, simple heart rate monitor can be helpful. And I'll show you in a minute why that is. So uh, here's a simple graphic of uh, what we call hypnograms showing sleep stages through the night. So uh, normally you have a little light sleep, deep sleep, light sleep, REM, shallow sleep, usually a little more deep sleep here, REM, shallow, REM, shallow, in a fairly regular cycle with most of the deep sleep early at night, early in the night. This is a typical pattern in a patient with the allergy analyst. They say, well, I don't have any trouble sleeping. I fall asleep okay. I sleep through the night okay. I just wake up feeling like I haven't slept. And you'll see that this person has no deep sleep, almost no REM. There's no cycle. Um, but what you can't see here are that in the sleep lab, we define an awakening as a disruption to the continuity of your sleep that lasts more than 30 seconds. It turns out that most people need to be awake for at least two minutes to remember having been awake. So this patient remembered waking up twice. She actually woke up 23 times. Uh, if the continuity of your sleep is disrupted for less than 30 seconds, we call that an arousal. She had 125 arousals. So the continuity of her sleep was disrupted, almost like somebody tapping on her shoulder uh, 150 times in less than seven hours of sleep. So kind of not surprising that she woke up feeling tired. And this is a slide to show uh, that if you look at heart rate here and sleep stages, each of these lines going all the way to the top is an awakening. Uh, if you had a ruler, you could see that each one of these awakenings lines up with a spike in the heart rate. So there's one stretch here where this patient's heart was calm and quiet as it should be, and she had a nice, almost uninterrupted chunk of deep sleep. But the rest of the night, awake asleep, awake asleep, awake asleep. So if you didn't have a heart rate, if you didn't have a sleep monitor, but you had a heart rate monitor showing your heart, was, heart rate was bouncing around all night, um, that would be a useful proxy in terms of estimating the quality of your sleep. So don't overlook the basics when you're trying to get a decent night's sleep. Uh, good sleep hygiene is important. Don't do anything too stimulating close to bedtime. Uh, a comfortable mattress is important since Ehlers-Danlos patients often are, are overly sensitive to sensory stimuli. Uh, any little bit of light and noise can be disrupting. So make your bedroom as dark and quiet as you can. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, if you have significant sleep apnea or limb movements, those should be treated, but only if they really are significantly contributing to the, the poor quality of your sleep. So uh, medications, uh, I'm not gonna go through a whole long list. I'll, I'll mention them, but uh, make the point that most people need a, a complex regimen of medications, uh, of multiple medications with complementary effects. For example, something for pain, something to reduce arousal, something to increase deep sleep. And finding the right combination can be a frustrating trial and error process, but when you find the right combination, uh, it's worth it. Again, the home sleep monitor can be helpful to see if what you're doing is making a difference. If it shows that you've started a new medication and it's reduced your awakenings by half, then you're probably on the right track. So uh, various medications can be used um, to improve sleep quality. Uh, the one I'll point out here is uh, uh, taking medications to block histamine. Uh, a lot of people are unaware of the fact that histamine in your brain is very stimulating. It's almost as stimulating as adrenaline in your brain. So the same histamine that makes your nose run and makes you sneeze and makes you itch um, can actually contribute to insomnia. And a lot of patients are, especially with mast cell dysfunction, are taking antihistamines, but the newer antihistamines are designed specifically not to get into your brain and block histamine there. Um, so if you're taking high doses of antihistamines during the day and having trouble sleeping, it may be that you need to take one of the older antihistamines uh, to block the histamine effects in your brain and help you sleep. So autonomic nervous system, for those of you not familiar with it, uh, is the part of the nervous system that regulates all functions that occur automatically. So your heart rate, your blood pressure, your breathing, digestion, body temperature, uh, and its job is to maintain a steady state. And it's primarily composed of the sympathetic nervous system, which is your fight or flight or stress response, um, and the parasympathetic nervous system, which is involved in rest and digestion. Um, thinking of these as the accelerator and the brake for your body is a helpful uh, metaphor. So autonomic dysfunction 
is characterized by a failure to maintain stability and by excessive fluctuations in things like heart rate and body temperature. Uh, and the, the uh, uh, primary feature of these syndromes is a tend to over-respond to minor stresses. And I won't go into the details. This is testing that involves measuring the sympathetic and parasympathetic activity. Uh, I just, I think you can see the contrast between these two slides. This person here, for example, at rest, her, both her sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems are at rest, they're not doing anything. This person, same thing, sitting quietly, their autonomic nervous system is all over the place. And so you can see just how much energy this person is wasting during the course of the day doing simple tasks like sitting compared to this person. So, uh, so autonomic dysfunction definitely can contribute to fatigue. And um, so hence, uh, and as I pointed out earlier with the heart rate monitor during sleep, autonomic dysfunction impairs the quality of your sleep. So uh, medications that can reduce or offset this tendency to over-respond to stresses can help conserve energy. So different causes of fatigue obviously require different treatments. As we've discussed, much of the fatigue in the loss comes from poor sleep, chronic pain, depression, and autonomic dysfunction. But of course, that doesn't mean these are the only factors. Uh, it's worth looking for other um, factors that may contribute a little bit less, but are still worth addressing. So uh, here I, I would point out particularly um, micronutrient deficiencies, and the most common ones I see are vitamin D, uh, vitamin B12, and magnesium. Uh, hormone deficiencies, and there I see a lot of testosterone deficiency, particularly in young women, and uh, salt fluid imbalance, where any degree of dehydration tends to aggravate fatigue. And then uh, mast cell dysfunction is a factor as well. I'll go through these just quickly. Uh, the most important point about vitamin D is to recognize that if you're deficient, it takes a lot of vitamin D to correct your deficiency. So normal level 30 to 100, if you have a level 20, just to raise that to 40, would take about a million units of vitamin D. Uh, B12, I think the important point here is that most laboratories will quote a normal range of about 200 to 1100. But if you're at the low end of normal below 300 or even below 350, a lot of people are clinically deficient in that range. Uh, the important point about measuring magnesium is that only one or 2% of your magnesium is in your bloodstream. So drawing your blood and doing a standard blood test for magnesium doesn't really tell you much about your magnesium levels. Um, often we just give people magnesium to see if it helps with pain. Uh, oral magnesium has the additional benefit of having a laxative effect for those people who are dealing with chronic constipation. Like vitamin D, it takes a lot of magnesium to correct the magnesium deficiency. The analogy I like to make is that correcting magnesium deficiency is like filling a bucket with an eyedropper. Um, testosterone deficiency, I found that a surprising number of my young women patients who were feeling better and sleeping better and having more energy and exercising regularly were still having trouble building muscle. And it turned out they were significantly and surprisingly deficient in testosterone. And treatment of that, either with oral DHEA or with topical testosterone, um, has been helpful. Um, I will point out this is, this is not a, uh, um, a mainstream treatment. And if this is something you want to pursue, you may need to see a naturopath or a functional medicine or something like that. Does um, um, uh, mainstream medicine does not recognize testosterone deficiency in women as a as an existing problem? Um, salt fluid imbalance. Uh, the major point I make here is that most of the patients I see who complain of lightheadedness and are told to eat plenty of salt and drink plenty of water are getting too much water and not enough salt. Um, and some have found that. Uh, to their own surprise, reducing the amount of water they drink has made them feel much better and spend much less time in the bathroom and actually improve their sleep because they're not getting up at night to go to the bathroom as much. Um, and one simple thing, if you're skeptical, is to ask your provider to check your check a random urine sodium. Uh, it will vary with what you've drank and when, but if your urine sodium is low, that means your body's trying to hold on to salt because you're not getting enough. So, um, and so I tell people, try to limit how much plain water you drink Electrolyte solutions are better than drinking plain water. Uh, I know some experts recommend drinking a gallon of water a day. It's really hard to eat enough salt to balance out that much water. So I think that's too much. Similarly, I find very few people need fludrocortisone, which is a drug that tricks the kidney into holding onto salt. Uh, most of them just need more salt. So uh, mast cell dysfunction is something now we 
we know is clearly more common in patients with allergy and loss. Um, and I just make the point here that mast cells overactivity can aggravate autonomic problems, fatigue, sleep, and pain. So it's uh, both directly and indirectly a major factor contributing to fatigue in many patients. Um, and so then dietary measures and medications to, to reduce mast cell symptoms can improve sleep and pain and fatigue. Uh, stimulants, I make the point that stimulants should not be used to treat fatigue. Um, occasionally in young, especially in young people with chronically low blood pressure, chronically lightheadedness, we'll give them small doses of stimulants to raise their heart rate and blood pressure, but that's very different from taking a stimulant because you're exhausted. Uh, taking a stimulant to keep going when you're exhausted just makes your fatigue worse. The exceptions are modafinil and armodafinil, um, which are medications that can improve focus and concentration without being physically stimulating. So uh, they, they aren't fooling you into thinking you have more energy than you really do. You don't crash when they wear off. Um, uh, and they, they don't particularly give you energy, but many of my patients will say they help me be more productive with the energy that I do have. So how do you reduce fatigue in patients with ehlers loss? Well, I hope you've seen here that Basically, you need to identify as many of the factors contributing to fatigue as you can uh, and address as many of them as possible in a comprehensive treatment program. Uh, this is a graphic a lot of my patients find helpful. Uh, if you think of having an energy pool, sleep is your major chance to put energy in the pool. Uh, various things take it out. Pain is a major energy drain. Every time you push through fatigue, you're, you're actually making it worse. Any degree of dehydration makes your fatigue worse. Uh, cognitive or emotional stresses, many other things are draining energy from the tank. So this is the simple answer to question, the question I get, okay, what do I have to do to get better? Think about this, think about improving sleep and reducing the things that drain energy from your system. So once you start doing a better job, reducing pain, addressing your depression, getting a better night's sleep, you'll feel better you'll start to do more. The more you do, the better you feel mood-wise, the more active you are during the day, the better you'll sleep, and that nasty, vicious cycle will go back the other way. And that is how fatigue gradually gets better. So thank you for your attention. Uh, always close by thanking colleagues who encouraged me along the way when a lot of these um, uh, thoughts that I had were, uh, <laughs> were considered uh, crazy. Uh, and I thank my patients for letting me um, uh, try these things out on them to see what works and what doesn't. Uh, thanks again.